is my pleasure to now give the virtual stage to Dr. Emily Farrell. She is the Director of Laboratory Operations at uh, Genomic Medicine Center at Children's Mercy Kansas City. And she will talk um, to us today about applications of third generation sequencing in unsolved disease. Thank you for the opportunity to present our group's work. Today, I'm gonna to be speaking about the applications of third generation sequencing in unsolved disease. The Center for Genomic Medicine at Children's Mercy Hospital was established in 2011. And at that time, it was one of the first hospitals located solely within a pediatric institution. And the reason for that was the recognition that rare disease collectively is not that rare. And in fact, when we look closer, there are 6,746 genetic or inherited diseases that are recognized in OMEM. They're estimated to affect one child in 30 in the United States. They cause one in six children's hospital admissions and they cause 20% of infant deaths. We know in our molecular diagnostic sequencing that our yields and symptom-driven clinical exome sequencing in patients with rare disease only range from 25 to 35%. And this has been replicated in multiple publications and is seen also within our internal clinical sequencing program. And we know that the addition of short read genome sequencing only incrementally increases the diagnostic yield. In recognition of the fact that over 50% of our children who undergo comprehensive clinical exome sequencing still do not receive a diagnosis, the Children's Mercy Research Institute and the Genomic Medi Medicine Center have created a PD pediatric data repository called Genomic Answers for Kids. And this has been created to facilitate the search for answers and novel treatments for pediatric con genetic conditions. 30,000 children and their families will be enrolled over the next seven years, which includes parents and available siblings. We estimate in total, this will be around 100,000 people. And after enrollment, we're using a comprehensive sequencing and analytic strategy. After enrollment in Genomic Answers for Kids, all of our patients will receive exome sequencing and short read genome sequencing. Subsequently, we will deploy functional genomics, which includes single cell genomics, such as single cell RNA on PBMC and tissue when our children undergo surgery. We also use whole genome bisulfite sequencing on selected samples. For samples that remain non-diagnostic after exome and genome sequencing, selected samples receive 10X linked read genomes, which has now been discontinued. We now use long read sequencing with HiFi genomes on our SQL instrumentation for our families that remain non-diagnostic after their initial analysis. As you might imagine, a comprehensive sequencing approach necessitates a comprehensive analytic approach. And in the Center for Genomic Medicine, we deploy both commercial software and in-house developed software to both call our variants and annotate them using software such as AnnoteSV, CAD, or RUNES. And we also are collecting our patient's phenotype using a system called Phenotips, which records family history and pedigree analysis and symptoms using HPO terminology. These are fed into programs such as Eximizer and Omely, which together with our annotated variants, gives our analysts a prioritized disease and gene list for future analysis. We also use quality metrics to ensure a sample identity and to allow us to prioritize our rare variants. Our analytic team uses visualization and interpretation software that again, is both commercially available, such as BioDiscoveries and XClinical, and that has been custom developed within our institution, such as Viking. We have a variant warehouse that is maintained that is cataloged of every variant that's ever been seen within our center. And this has a public facing version that all people can access. And of course we use standard technologies or in platforms uh, such as Excel, IGV, and the UCSC genome browser. And even despite our best efforts, we still have a significant portion of patients that remain diagnostic. And we have several factors that are remaining analysis challenges. This is, includes singleton analyses, where most of, we have a significant number of children where their parents are not available. And this is a problem both for the recognition of de novo disease, but also for autosomal recessive disease, which affects 21% approximately of our patient population. Coverage remains challenging especially when we're looking at difficult regions of the genome. Also repetitive regions remain challenging for sequencing using short read. This includes areas that have pseudogenes or expansion disorders such as fragile X or myotonic dystrophy. 
And lastly, while greatly improved, structural variant detection remains challenging. And this includes the recognition of deletions and duplications, also importantly, inversions and translocations. Because we recognize our sequencing and uh, analysis challenges, we've collaborated with PacBio to generate 80 genomes at 30-fold HiFi coverage on the CEPL2 system. We've selected TRIO cases that are negative after exome sequencing and genome sequencing, so we are taking our most difficult cases and using them for this study. The sample preparation involves DNA isolation that's completed using the Comagic 360 automation, and this was chosen because it's the platform we use in our clinical sequencing internally. Samples are sheared to a size of 15 to 20 KB with an input of five micrograms of DNA currently. Libraries have been prepared and size selected in a novel workflow allowing for the parallel processing of up to 20 samples. For our HiFi analytics strategy, Sequencing alignment is being completed using Build38 for all of our samples, which is also where we're completing all of our research analyses. Variant detection is done using a combination of deep variant that detects single nucleotide variants and indels, and WhatsApp, which provides phasing of the deep variant calls. We also are using PBSV for detection of structural variants. The variant annotation is utilizing two workflows. The first is a novel tool set that had been developed to annotate the structural variants, both for population frequency and for the impact on known genes. And we also use RUNES, as previously mentioned, which has been established at the Genomic Medicine Center and is the rapid understanding of nucleotide effects software. We, of course, perform QC metrics, and we found that the single nucleotide variant and indel calls are highly concordant with short read whole genome sequencing. But we've also found that HiFi sequencing has revealed over 450,000 single nucleotide variants and indels and about 10,000 structure variants per genome that were previously undetected using short read genome sequencing. When we then apply a stringent allele frequency filter of 0.01, we're left with approximately 150 rare variants for further analysis and annotation. While sequencing and analysis are still ongoing. I'd like to share some, highlight some of the cases that we have that show the impact of this study. The first challenge is that of singleton analysis. And for this case, CMH1610 is now a four-year-old girl who was actually diagnosed prenatally with hepatosplenomegaly, which persisted after birth. By six weeks of age, a liver biopsy had been completed and the results were concerning for several abnormalities including signs of liver failure. Based on this finding, an initial clinical NGS testing revealed a single pathogenic variant in MPC1, which is the gene associated with neiman pick disease type C. This is an autosomal recessive disorder, and importantly, parental samples are not available for analysis. Subsequently, the clinical team ordered the biochemical testing and the oxysterol testing was found to be abnormal. Based on this, the patient was given a clinical diagnosis of neiman pick disease type C, even though we only had one, they identified one variant in MPC1. The family was then enrolled in genomic answers for kids, and we were able to identify the second intronic pathogenic variant. The second variant is at a site at plus five from the exon and ultimately results in the disruption of the intron 12 donor site and the deletion of 25 amino acids. And this has been reported previously in patients affected with neiman pick disease. The second previously identified variant was a frame shift variant that leads to premature stop and loss of function. However, now we have two variants, but we still do not have parental samples and the phasing of these variants are unknown. The assumption was made that the variants are in trans, which means they're on opposite chromosomes and that they were inherited from one from each parent. However, in the clinical world, especially in the face of a severe disease, we don't like to be in the area where we're assuming that something is happening. Because of this, they were nominated and submitted for the HiFi sequencing program. What we found with this program is that the two alleles were indeed on trans. You can see with allele one on the far right of the screen that we have the intronic variant, and the second allele on the left was found, the frameshift variant on the other allele. 
So now we've confirmed that we have two pathogenic variants in MPC1 that are again on opposite alleles, meaning they are inherited from each parent. And this is consistent with our clinical diagnosis of Neiman Pick. But what I wanna point out, and that's important for this, is that in this case, we had biochemical testing that was able to clarify the genetic results quite quickly, which allowed for uh, intervention and early treatment for this, this patient. But for most of our patients, especially in the world of autosomal recessive disease, we don't have established biochemical markers that would allow us to clarify the genetic testing. So the phasing in this case, and for other cases like it, is extremely important. The second challenge that we encourage and remains despite genome, whole genome sequencing with short read is coverage. And a case that exemplifies this challenge is CMH2060. And this child has developmental delay and seizures. A subsequent MRI revealed leucencephaly, which means smooth brain. This patient had clinical exome sequencing that was negative in January of this year, 2020. They also had research genome sequencing that had been negative. HIFI sequencing was completed in September of 2020, so just a few weeks ago. And interestingly, what we found when we did the analysis on the HIFI genome is that we identified a pathogenic variant in CEP85L that affects the start codon of this gene. Even more interesting is that CEP85L related leucencephaly was first published in April of 2020. And what I'll show is that HIFI produced more even coverage across the region. On this slide, what we see on the top is that we have the HIFI genome that was ran to 30X coverage. And then on the bottom, we have the 50X coverage of the 10X linked read genome. And here in the box, we can see the variant that affects the start codon. Again, on the top, we can see nice even coverage throughout the region that is visualized. So where in the bottom and the 10X linked read genome, despite having much higher coverage, we can see that it's very low over the start codon. And indeed, this variant was only contained in four reads, all in one direction, which means it was difficult to determine whether this was a true variant or noise. This case also exemplifies the challenge that we as analysts have, and that every day there are new disease genes published, and it's difficult to keep up with how often these are being published and redoing analyses. A third challenge that we encounter often is that of repetitive sequences. So we have a large family, CMH1541, that is quite well known to our center and our study team, that has multiple affected individuals with dystonia, seizures, and ataxia with variable degrees of severity. In one generation, we visualize infantile onset, which we see in CMH1541.05, but in the parental generation, we see adult onset of symptoms with dystonia and CMH 41-03 and 08. This family has had exhaustive clinical testing, including clinical microarray, exon array, panel testing, exome and genome testing, which were all negative. They've also had targeted molecular testing that was negative. Because of this, they were referred for research and they've had again, research exome and genome sequencing that have remained negative. In total, we've enrolled nine family members uh, across the generations, which is quite large in our sub, sub study. This is the shortened pedigree from this family. So in this family, we have a large family with neurological symptoms that appear to show anticipation, and we have negative testing thus far. And we know from practice or from previous examples that expansion disorders will often manifest, especially neurologically, with ataxia and dystonia or movement disorders. So in light of that knowledge and the negative testing, and the strong suspicion again of an expansion disorder, we referred this family for high fi sequencing. And we've actually completed it on four family members in total. And initially no known disease genes were identified. Since we continue to strike out for this family, we then have taken a candidate gene approach and searched through the literature. And indeed we found a novel disorder that was recently published last year called FAME, which is familial adult myoclonic epilepsy linked to chromosome two. And this is caused by a pentameric insertion in the gene STAR-D7. And indeed, we were quite excited when we looked in this gene, STAR-D7, and found that our affected individuals had an expansion that you can see here with the wide purple bars. 
and CMH 1401-04 and 05, which again is the child that had infantile onset of symptoms. This is now shown in OMIM, and you can see some of the features associated that have been reported. Although in the initial report, it was primarily um, manifesting in adolescence or adulthood. Nonetheless, we see some of the same features such as myoclonus and seizures and tremor and autosomal dominant inheritance. All affected family members have been found to have the repeat insertion. Because this is a novel, disorder within our center that we have not seen before, we've confirmed this with a triplet primed repeat PCR. And you can see at the bottom right, the repeat expansion PCR that was run that shows the stuttering associated with an expansion and a triplet repeat. This repeat pattern is absent from all the sequence samples that we've done at Children's Mercy internally. And importantly, is also absent in a control set of 40 samples of high coverage high fi genomes. The one caveat to this is that the data set is still quite small compared to short read genome sequencing. Nonetheless, we feel that we've identified an, a phenotypic expansion in this novel disease. And it also is not only highlighting the power of the long read sequencing and recognizing these pentameric expansions or novel triplet repeat expansions, but it's also highlighting the importance of continuing to generate control data sets so that we can begin to evaluate what's normal from something that might be disease associated. Within our data set internally, we also identified a second propan that has dystonia, CMH 2092. And it was also reflects the HIFI sequencing after negative exome and genome sequencing. And in this patient, we identified a repeat insertion of 80 repeats. So this repeat expansion of similar size was not detected internally in the CMH HIFI samples. This repeat size is smaller than what was reported in the initial data set, but it's much larger than anything we've seen in our internal data set. So now we've been left with trying to determine whether this normal variation, if this is an expanded allele that may be associated with disease, or perhaps this person might have a premutation allele like we see in other disorders such as fragile X. We've been able to go back and examine those 40 control data set HIFI genomes from HPRC and in fact, we found a second sample, a second singular sample that has the exact same insertion. So based on this knowledge that we now have two samples, one control with no reported phenotype and one with a quite severe phenotype of dystonia, we decided this is normal variation. So again, this is highlighting the importance of generating our control data sets, but also the importance of data sharing. The goal of our center goes actually much further than rare disease. And so once the HIFI genome is generated, what we begin to discuss and look at are what additional applications can be applied. And in our center, pharmacogenetics is near and dear to our hearts, but also it's really the model for precision medicine. Ironically, one of the most important genes um, in pharmacogenetics is CYP2D6, and it plays an important role for drug metabolism. However, it's one of the most complex loci to sequence because there's known pseudogenes there's gene conversions and many different variations within this region that complicate the analysis. So we're beginning to evaluate how we might use these HIFI genomes to look at our pharmacogenetic genes and in particular CYP2D6. In one of our cases, CMH2438, what we initially found and have confirmed is that we have an entire gene deletion over CYP2D6. And in fact, this is called the STAR5 allele and it's found in about 3% of, of the European population. When you have homozygous STAR5, so homozygous deletion, or if the STAR5 deletion is found um, in trans with a loss of function variant, this is associated with a poor metabolizer phenotype. And this is information that the clinicians can use to help guide dosing medications for genes that are metabolized through the CYP2D6 pathway. This is important in childhood, but also in adulthood as well. And so while we see that we can detect the whole gene deletion in the short read genome sequencing on the bottom, what I think is more clear is that we're refining those breakpoints a little bit better with our HIFI genome. And so while we're still ongoing in this part of the project is early in development, we anticipate that by using these long reads, the HIFI sequencing and looking at CYP2D6, we're going to increase our sensitivity and specificity for determining the star alleles and the genotype for our patients, allowing for better targeted treatment of their medications.
When we look at the initial eight samples included in our A data set, these have resulted in one variant phasing, which is confirming the clinical diagnosis, which is CMH 1610. We have the one new clinical diagnosis where the even coverage over exon one led us to detect the newly reported disease gene. And we also have two novel gene identifications that I wasn't able to present today. And again, the sequencing and analysis are ongoing for the remaining samples, but we're all excited to continue to work through the data. So in summary, we've developed in collaboration a novel sample preparation and analysis pipelines to support HiFi sequencing of human genomes using the SQL2 platform. The HiFi sequencing is resulting on average in over 450,000 SQL nucleotide variants and indels and about 10,000 structural variants that were previously undetected in short read genome sequencing. And we've already seen that the incorporation of long read sequencing into a pediatric genetic disease study has resulted in new diagnoses in these preliminary analyses. So I'd like to take a moment to thank the teams, both on the Children's Mercy side and the PAC Bio side that have contributed so much time and effort into this exciting project. And we'd all like to make sure that we acknowledge the patients and their families for their participation. We wouldn't be able to do any of our work without their partnership. And I thank you very much.